Hey guys, what's up? This is David Patrick Carey with Church of the Eternal Logos, and today I want to speak to you guys about the Jesus Sutras. I mentioned in my last video I wanted to make a video on this. I found this reading, I read it uh, probably about three, two or three weeks ago. Um, I found it incredible. I really enjoyed it. I think it's something that you guys will like too. Um, if you're not familiar, the Jesus Sutras, it's written by Martin Palmer. He's an Engl- he's an Anglican English gentleman who's also a Chinese scholar. And when he was a young man in his early 20s, he spent two years as a missionary in Hong Kong. That's when he became aware that there was these ancient Chinese or Chinese Christian sutras that existed. And that kind of set him on a journey of interest throughout his life. Of course, he was doing all these other types of research. But in the 80s and then eventually in the 90s, he, with a group of people, discovered the Dachin Pagoda. So some of these texts had already been discovered. Uh, they exist in Japan. One of them's in Paris. And there's four different sutras that I want to talk to you guys about. These are the sutra of the teaching of the world honored one. This is the first sutra that I'll be talking about. The second one is the sutra of cause and effect and salvation. The third one is the sutra of origins. And the fourth one is the sutra of Jesus Christ. Now, what's really interesting about these sutras is that it's a conscientious effort to blend Taoism and Christianity. Because at the time that these sutras were written, this is um, in the seventh century, so imagine we got the Silk Road going on. We have uh, the uh, the Tang Dynasty taking power in China. The Tang Dynasty is one of the the most uh, prosperous dynasties in uh, Chinese history. They were in uh, well, at least when when Christianity was arriving, it was much more open to uh, Western ideas and religion. In fact, the the Tang Emperor found Christianity to be. Uh, really enlightening. They called it the religion of light, and that plays into the story today. So in the seventh century, there is a Christian missionary from the Church of the East, which I need to make another video on uh, just the Church of the East, because it's fascinating about Christianity getting into India, into the Middle East, the Assyrian Empire, the Persian Empire, um, and then getting into China and that type of stuff. But however, today we're going to focus on China. Um, It's a a gentleman named... Alopen, so A L O P E N, but I've also the way that Martin Palmer spells it is A L O B E N, so Alopen or Aloben. Um, he's a Sassanian missionary. So the Sassanian Empire is essentially modern day uh, Iraq um, through over to Iran. And this empire. Was, it actually persecuted Christians when they first started to moving, moving into that region of the Middle East. And they killed like a hundred thousand uh, Christians at one at one point. However, Christianity, as it always has been uh, throughout history, is when it is persecuted and all these martyrs die, it comes back with a vengeance. And in fact, it became such a popular re- religion in the Sassanian Empire that they allowed it as long as the bishops and the patriarchs of the Church of the East dis- disassociated themselves with the Byzantium, with uh, the Byzantine. You know, uh, empire, Christianity at Constantinople um, and Rome. So as long as the Christians in in the Sassanian Empire uh, disassociated themselves, they were kind of cool with Christianity. And in fact, uh, it was a very popular religion. If it wasn't for Islam, all of the Middle East would be Christian, which definitely would have changed the the arc of human history. But um, so Alopen, 7th century, 635, he finds his way into China. He is allowed to present his new religion of light to the Tang emperor at the time. And the emperor found it incredible. In fact, for, for them, it, it meshed with Taoism because Taoism, from their standpoint, was a monotheism. Lao Tzu was very uh, emphatic that there's only one way, the way of the Tao. And the way that Christianity talks about, you know, Jesus Christ being the way, the truth, and the light, uh, their theology of the Holy Spirit mapped on to their understanding of chi, which is the breath of life, which I will briefly touch upon when I read through these things today. But uh, 
So a low pond, uh, he presents Christianity to the Tong, to the Tang emperor, and it's incredible. In fact, he sanctions them to build a pagoda that's called the Da Qin Pagoda, D A Q I N Da Qin, and. That pagoda was kind of the home base for for Christianity in China because this is very this is on the western side of the Chinese Empire and if so in the Tang Dynasty Xi'an the city of Xi'an and when I was in China I actually went to Xi'an of course it's no longer the city that it used to be but Xi'an was the capital of the Tang Dynasty of course it gets moved to Beijing and um, eventually later in history and the capital of China kind of moves to different locations but during the Tang Dynasty it was Xi'an and th- so we're we're more on the western side of China, as opposed to what will later become the eastern side of China. But um, the, China, the, the, the Christianity that enters into China, is, it, it's from the Church of the East. So if you Google that, you'll see that that's a distinct um, uh, identity of Christianity that's a little bit different. And the Church of the East is considered to be an Nestorian, although that's debated now among scholars, and it goes back to Nestorius, um, a Christian bishop who had a different Christology. And it, it essentially, they believed that Christ was more human than divine. He was essentially the most uh, divine that a human could be without being God. So Jesus wasn't God in the Nestorian Christology, theology. And this was the general uh, theology of the Church of the East. So same as in India, same as in China, same as in uh, the Persian Empire, they typically had this Christology that Jesus was more human than divine. Um, But they believed in the virgin birth and all this stuff. So they believed in these miraculous stories, these narratives around Christ. However, they didn't believe him to be equal. Uh, you know, co-substantial, equal to God, as the Byzantines and the Romans did. So the Roman Catholic Church, and then you have the Byzantium uh, Orthodox faith. So there, Jesus Christ is equal to God, and that's what allows the Trinitarian theology to emerge. That's why Nestorius was such a controversial figure, because... um, his theology kind of wrecked havoc on what exactly the the Trinity is, because if Jesus isn't God, then how do you exactly have a full Trinity? Um, But anyways, that's why it was deemed, essentially deemed uh, heretical uh, in later councils, and that's that. Eventually, Nestorius actually gets kicked out, and he has to go into exile, but that's not part of the story today. So, Within the Jesus Sutras, there's a handful of different sutras that are presented, and these were all found in the Dun, Dun Huang uh, cave. So if you Google Dun Huang, you'll see that there's these cave systems, again, in Western China, and scholars in the 70s found all these texts all over. I mean, it's not just Christian, it's Taoist, it's Buddhist, it's all these ancient texts, Zoroastrian. Um, but what's really interesting is is how Christianity was blending its faith with Taoism and Buddhism. Now, other things that are really interesting that are presented in this book is that Christianity, men and women in China had pretty much equal status. Of course, women weren't priests or anything like that, but but it's ex- it, uh, it, it's fairly emphatic and clear in its emphasis on men and men in the way that they should treat women as equals. This was not the Buddhist case. If you're familiar with early Buddhism in China, lots of slaves. That's how they built a lot of the, the Buddhist monasteries is with tons and tons of slaves. And this is going to become uh, very contentious later in Chinese history uh, because in the ninth century, religious persecution is going to emerge. And that's basically between the Taoist and the Buddhist because the Buddhism was essentially a foreign religion. And there's a female... Uh, becomes an empress, her husband dies, and she kind of takes over the empire, and she's all about Buddhism. And therefore, she starts persecuting Christians and Taoists and Confucians and all this stuff, which then has this... um, th- it gets it's responded then to by the Taoists essentially kicking out the Buddhists and, and kicking out all their slaves, which they had thousands and thousands of slaves. So, again, really interesting and, and um, fits with my general narrative that I've been talking about is the ethical 
uh, impulse of Christianity. So you could see even in early China, Christians were known to be some of the most ethical people. And that's why the, in the Tang Dynasty, they were very favorable to Christians and they allocated funds for them to build their pagodas and stuff like that because um, they were they're also defenders of the Chinese Empire. So According to Martin Palmer, one of the other things which the Tang emperors liked about Christianity is that the Christians would actually fight off other invaders from the north. So, you know, this is way before Genghis Khan or anything like that, but but Mongolians and, and stuff like that, they would come in from the north, and the Christians had no problem with fighting them, therefore defending the Tang, the, the Chinese empire, and uh, they essentially were elevated to a very high status within uh, within uh, the Tang, Tang dynasty. So that's really interesting stuff. And within the sutras that are presented by Martin Palmer, you have the doctrinal sutras, which I'm going to be going through today. And then you have the liturgical sutras, which I am not going to be covering at all. And then you have the Xi'an Stele, which is a 279 centimeter limestone slab that's then carved with uh, Chinese characters in Syriac, and it's depicting the history of Christianity within China for essentially 150 years. And uh, then it gets, then, you know, Christianity gets persecuted and the stele gets uh, buried in the ground. And then it wasn't until like um, the 17th century where it's rediscovered. So very interesting stuff. Now, uh, Martin Palmer, let's see, um, some of the interesting things that he covers in this, in this book is how, um, like first how they discovered Da Qin, uh, which is the name I believe I already mentioned is the name for Rome. So that's the Chinese name for Rome. And that's why then the Christian pagoda gets the name, the Da Qin pagoda, because it's considered to be the religion from Rome. Um, so he has a really cool narrative about how he's, in China, he's with a group of different Chinese scholars. You know, he he and like another person were the only ones that were Christian, but they're trying to find this this legend of this pagoda that was talked about by a formal Japanese scholar uh, before World War II, which he believed was actually a Japanese spy. But he was the one of the way the Japanese spies would get into China is they would present themselves as scholars, so then they would be able to travel through China and then they would start mapping things for the Japanese Empire, but one of these Japanese scholars actually discovered uh, the Da Qin Pagoda, and he knew that it was a pr- Christian pagoda, and then uh, Martin Palmer is then trying to trace this back, and that's how the book starts. So eventually they find it, and then he talks about how he's doing a BBC radio interview, and um, he's kind of like walking through it because it was like eight stories high or something. Really cool stuff, really cool stuff. But um, I highly recommend that there's way more in this book that I'm not getting to. Uh, Martin Palmer does a really great job of kind of giving a narrative of all this stuff. Um, in, in regards to Nestorianism, this would, this would be one of the scholastic critiques of this book is that Palmer frames it in this Nestorian context. However, if you're familiar with Sebastian Brock, who I've talked about in regards to Syriac Christianity, because he's kind of the lead scholar over at Oxford that translates all the Syriac into English. Uh, he's not very fond of the title Nestorian because he thinks that not everybody had these same Christologies, and for some of them, Jesus was God, so it's not a very good label to make mass generalizations on these people. However, so one of the first things that I wanted to get to is the, the Sutra of the Teachings of the World Honored One. So uh, one of the sutras that I'll be reading, the, the last one, Sutra 4, it's called the Sutra of Jesus Christ. That one's really interesting because it's believed to be written actually in Tibet or at least directed towards Tibetan Buddhists. So when I read it, you'll see how they're trying to fuse Buddhism into Christian theology to essentially show how Christianity supersedes Buddhism, which, uh, from the ethical perspective, they felt like they had the higher ground, given the slavery and all this stuff that was going on in China. Um, The Sutra of the Teachings of the World Honored One, the first one, again, this was written in 641, so I'll open the uh, Sassanian uh, missionary, He's there in 635, 641. We're now getting the first sutra that we know of um, where they're blending Taoism with Christianity, essentially fusing the way with uh, Christ, the logos, and then chi with the Holy Spirit, the breath of life, the force, energy, creative spirit, all this stuff. 
Um, and so the first sutra is basically a reiteration of a lot of the central tenets and teachings of Jesus Christ. A lot of the stuff you guys are already familiar with. So I don't want to read that one to you guys necessarily. And if you get the book, then you can read them all on your own. Um, it's basically a lot is taken from Matthew's Sermon on the Mount, and then it's presented in a new way. And like I believe it's eight chapters for that one. It's only like a handful of pages, but uh, in the Chinese, it's it's eight chapters, and it also takes from the teachings of the apostles or the the, the didache or the didache, uh, which I have a copy of over there. Um, but uh, I'm not going to show it to you guys. But anyways, that's another really interesting book that we have partials of, which the uh, the Twelve Apostles was a text that was essentially was floating around the Church of the East, and it was a synthesis of some of the main tenets of Christianity, as long as with a lot of the liturgical stuff. So um, some of these people that were traveling around trying to spread Christianity, they could have the Twelve Apostles, and they could have the message of Christ in one place, but they could also have how to perform the services and all that type of stuff. So... Um, then you have the Sutra of Cause and Effect and Salvation, which is a very interesting one. And that's definitely a mixture and you'll be able to read it. Cause I'm going to read the whole thing to you guys. And I don't want to make, I'm already at 16 fucking minutes. I didn't want to make this video very long, but there's just so much information that it's kind of hard not to. The second sutra, the Sutra of Cause and Effect and Salvation, is a really nice synthesis of Taoism and Christianity that I wanted to read the whole thing to you guys and see what you thought. And then there's the Sutra of Origins, which I wasn't going to read at all because it's a kind of uh, a rehashing of the things that were said in the second sutra. Um, it, it's a little bit more explicitly Christian, uh, Christian, so as opposed to the Taoism that you'll find in the second sutra. And one of the prominent concepts in the third sutra is Wu Wei from Taoism, the, the idea of like actionless action. Um, that's a prominent theme within this Christian framing of, of, of these conversations with Taoism, if you will. Um, and then I wanted to talk, read the Sutra of Jesus Christ, which is like five pages, but it's a, it's a strong synthesis with Tibetan Buddhism and Christianity. So um, let's see, what's the first thing I want to read here? I'm going to read the last two chapters of the Sutra of the Teachings of the World Honored One, because the first... Uh, the first six chapters are things that you already know. Essentially, if you've read the Gospels, the whole Gospel narrative of Christ and the Sermon on the Mount, it's being rehashed in uh, in the first few chapters there. So I want to skip past that and get to chapter seven of of this, where uh, you're starting to see the more blending of Christianity and Taoism. So wherever you hear the way, obviously you can see how the, these authors are trying to blend the way, the Tao, with Jesus. So <clears throat> here's uh, chapter seven um, of the first sutra, the sutras of the teachings of the world honored one. And I'm going to skip the first paragraph and go to the second one. So this is verse five. Those who accept the words of the Messiah will live in his realm, worship the world honored one, and you will dwell with the Messiah and the father in the heavenly palace. This will be such joy and happiness. Nothing will pass and nothing change. The one who is sent was sent by the Father, the world-honored one. If you do not worship him, you will end up worshiping evil spirits. You will be impure and unclean, and you will be dragged into the darkness of the earth prisons. From there, you cannot return to the good place, but must dwell with the evil ghost, Satan. To show enlightenment, he descended from heaven and taught the true religion so truth would prevail. His disciples were not just men, but were created anew by the world-honored one. In the name of the Messiah, these disciples healed and tended to the sick. So, uh, you're going to see an emphasis, well, maybe you won't because I skipped it, but, but there's a heavy emphasis on your morals and your ethics because it's trying to fill in some of these gaps that maybe Taoism wasn't developing. It, it maybe had a nice cosmology, a nice understanding of natural, um, uh, I guess for a lack of a better word, natural science maybe, or natural spirituality, because Taoism is a kind of a monotheism of paganism, Chinese paganism to a degree. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah. The the great evil ghost called Pato, who lives on the dead, 
turned the world against the disciples and stirred up trouble for them. He pursued the disciples across the face of the earth. They even seized the Jews. He insinuated terrible persecutions of both young and old. Bethlehem is in the land of the Jews, that is, in the West. And here even the king turned against the truth, saying that he was Lord. The Jews were defeated, many killed and scattered across the world, helping to make more disciples for the Messiah. Those who declared those who declared for the world honored one were served the world honored one. Yet most people just wanted to continue oh, I skipped a line. Those who declared for the world honored one and served the world honored one were hated. Yet most people just wanted to continue to believe. Most of the Messiah's disciples were martyred, martyred and their nation was destroyed. Consequently, many followed with greater enlightenment and saw the true way. This holy event was for all on earth and came from the world honored one. People need to do right and avoid wrong. The world honored one seeks to save all. This is what all the kings and founders of holiness have sought. But in Bethlehem and in Persia, the believers were killed and evil laws passed against them. Those who, per- who, those who protested were destroyed. Those who survived in Bethlehem did so only because of the world-honored one. The evil ghost spirit makes people create false deities, but the world-honored one sent the Messiah. The world-honored one caused the holy event to touch many throughout the world. Thus did all become clear and falsely disappear. Seeing this, the Messiah came down from heaven. This physical manifestation took place 641 years ago, and now everyone across the world believes. All can see what has been achieved. You may have been taught that people cannot save themselves. This is why the heavenly honored one sends the spirit force to all places to save everyone. And it goes to all, it goes to all that live and teach the truth. This is different from what the various deities and spirits do. So that's a, an, another thing that's emphatic in a lot of these sutras is that um, anybody can be saved. It's based on your ethics. It's based on your morality. And therefore, what Jesus Christ came to do is teach this path, which is the Tao, which is the way. And when you do that, you're going to be in tune with nature, but you're going to be in tune with the cosmic uh, forces of the universe and therefore with God himself. This is chapter eight of the same sutra. The Messiah chose ordinary people to be his disciples. The true religion comes from heaven, and I teach it. Know this. This is not the way of the holy founders and kings. They chose their disciples from the rich and the powerful and control things through petty people. The Messiah follows the true law of prayer and liturgy. All will be done, and everyone will know this is what the one sacred spirit wills. The sacred spirit also plays a very prominent role, and you'll see that in the second sutra that I read. But the Holy Spirit, uh, at times, is more important than Jesus. Because if you've read Acts, obviously the Holy Spirit, um, and this is where the whole filioque, the distinction between the Orthodox and, and Catholicism, whether the Spirit comes from Jesus or it comes from God, but uh, the Holy Spirit is what allows normal Christians to heal and perform miracles right here and now. The one sacred spirit will save anybody who wants to be saved. The soul returns to heaven if it obeys the path of the law. That is, not to trick people, fool or deceive, and not to say false things or do wicked acts. This is the law. Those who wander from the true way, the Tao, are sinful and follow not the path of the sacred spirit, but rather a false way. It is possible to return to the truth through the world-honored one, Okay. It is possible to return to the truth, though, for the world honored one, one can bring you back. There is, there is no other true way that people can walk. Any other way is judged to be false. Its followers are as bad as those who worship the sun, moon, stars, or even the fire gods. They follow the evil spirits and will go to the fiery earth prisons forever. This is because they need greater faith. If they don't follow the one sacred spirit, they will dwell with evil spirits and other hell dwellers and ghosts. This is as written in the sutras drawn from the true law teachings of the one sacred spirit. When the time comes for all to end, for all life to end, evil spirits will seize people and judgment will come from heaven for all to see. All that is wrong will increase. That is why the one sacred spirit took a body and came teaching, saying, I am the Messiah. 
For three and a half years I came. For three and a half years I struggled with the wicked deeds of the evil ones, and everyone could see this clearly. Now act virtuously, and those who have no faith will be unable to withstand the judgment of the heavenly honored one. These are the evil ghost spirits. All this the Messiah, and the one sacred spirit. Watch closely from heaven. When the world ends, the dead will be raised and judged. Those who believe the teachings, who act, who act virtuously, and whose hearts follow the true way will go to heaven. There you will be happy forever. Those who know the true way of the one sacred spirit and have read the good book, but do not follow this or the one sacred spirit's commands will dwell with the evil spirits and ghosts in the earth prisons and serve the evil spirits forever. If these earth prisons will, they will suffer in a great fire, which burns without end. Listen to this. You who wish to be saved know that what you have heard is true. If there is anybody not willing to receive this grace, think on your soul and body and their fate. Anybody displeased who does not listen will be cast and dwell forever with the evil spirits in the earth prisons. So now you're getting the, uh, the duality of, um, you know, the earth prisons, hell, essentially. I wanted to <clears throat> read a little bit from the book on what exactly the second sutra that I'm going to be reading from is right here. Um, this is called the Sutra of Cause and Effect and Salvation. It is In Chinese, it is called the First Treatise on the Oneness of Heaven. It is strikingly similar in tone, style, and content to parts of the Indo-Greek Buddhist sutra called Milindapana, a teaching about Buddhist cosmology and philosophy thought to have been written between the 1st century B.C. and the 1st century A.D. In Sanskrit, its title means The Questions from King Menander, also known as Melinda. King Menander ruled from 150 to 135 B.C. Okay, and he was the most famous of the Greek kings in his region. We believe that in the second Jesus Sutra, we have found a lost Indo-Greek Christian version of the Milinda Panda that would have been written and used in the Swat Valley by Christian communities that vanished between the 8th and 10th centuries. The, Christ the Christian communities in this era area drew on both classical Greek and classical Buddhist influences in a region that from the 2nd to the 6th century AD was one of the most important and vital Buddhist centers for art, missionary movements, and philosophy. And remember also, Buddhism spread all the way through Pakistan and into Afghanistan. I mean, some of you guys may be aware that that's why the Taliban actually destroyed these ginormous stone statues of the Buddha in Afghanistan with rockets. They essentially just shot rockets at it and, and turned it into just a bunch of rocks, but before there was a ginormous, gorgeous um, Buddha statue that if you Google it on uh, online, you'll be able to see photos of it. So, gosh, this video is already 27 minutes long. Okay, so so here's the second sutra. Remember, it's based on this Indo-Greek uh, Buddhist text where it's this king and people are asking questions. The king's asking questions to the wise man and the wise man's giving answers. So it's kind of framed in that same way. So chapter one of the Sutra of Cause and Effect and Salvation. The question is asked, what is the cause of human beings? The answer is, humanity is created by that which can be, can be seen and that which cannot what causes the visible and the invisible? Everything under heaven consists of four elements, earth, water, fire, and wind. So right there, you know that it's not a Chinese source because in China, they have five elements. They also include metal. All brought by the sacred spirit. The question is asked, of what of the four elements, of what are the four elements made? The answer is given. There is not one thing under heaven which has not been created, and there is not a single creation which was not made by the one sacred spirit. Without the sacred spirit, nothing would have been brought into existence. It is like building a house. The very first thing needed is a place to build. In this way, the one sacred spirit caused existence to inhabit a space. It happened because the one sacred spirit looked with compassion on all life. Chapter 2. The one sacred spirit clearly distinguishes the visible and the invisible, heaven and earth. And causing existence, the sacred spirit 
is like the wind. Being a spirit, nothing can be touched, nothing can be seen. But you can see the effects of the one sacred spirit. You can see everything it brings into existence. Nothing else can do this. The one sacred spirit made a vast multitude of beings. Everything under heaven is filled with the sacred spirit. Creatures such as the worm or the deer cannot understand speech and do not know their origin. There are multitudes, but no two or three are alike. Not everything under heaven is visible. People sincerely believe that the invisible is the gracious action of the spirits, but it is important to distinguish the multitude of living things because no spirit could create such diversity. So many millions of beings, visible and invisible, each containing two characteristics created by the one sacred spirit, all people have these two aspects. The first has no understanding of the teaching, and the other does. If they were one, would there be any understanding? Without there being the two, how could the sacred spirit create human beings? No one knows. Everything under heaven has two qualities created by the sacred spirit. The one sacred spirit made the two. So that's right there reference to the yin and yang, how, um, you know, that uh, the one gives birth to the two and the two gives birth to the three. Uh, the one sacred spirit made two. Everything under heaven has two natures and everything is united under heaven. The, the two natures are body and sacred spirit. These two reside in all existence under heaven. It is not only heavenly spirit, it is body as well, but the body only lives for a short time while the heavenly soul lives in the power of the one sacred spirit and never decays. It is this power that the one sacred spirit which animates all people. Um... Gosh, I'm trying to think. Should I read all this? Okay, chapter three. We'll go ahead. The soul has... uh... All right. The soul has five skandhas, S-K-A-N-D-A-S, skandhas. These are form, perception, consciousness, action, and knowledge. Everyone can see, hear, and speak. Without eyes, you cannot see. Without hands, you cannot act. Without feet, you cannot walk. Just as one and two are united, so is everything mutually dependent. The sun and fire are united, and one fire emerges from the sun. They share one nature, but without the sun, there is no fire. They are the same whole, yet are different from the sun never dies while the fire needs wood to keep burning. It has no inherent light of its own. Fire is not self-generating, yet the sun is. It is different from the fire. The power of this one sacred spirit is like this, different but the same. The same but different. Thus the sacred spirit is different from human existence. The soul of a human being can only exist because of the five skandhas. Without the five skandhas, there is no soul. No other sacred spirit can do this. Only by being clothed in the physicality of the five skandhas can the soul savor the beauties the beauties and wonders of existence the soul needs to be physically clothed the soul dwelling in the body is like the wheat seeds from which spring not just wheat but more wheat seeds the earth is like the five skandhas the grain is put in, into the ground and is thus able to grow it produces more seed this is this is natural and requires neither manure nor water just a gentle breeze and the breeze the wind of course breath that's all the holy spirit This is like the soul and the body. It does not require food, drink, or clothes. Heaven and earth will pass away, and the ghosts of the dead will come back to life. The souls of the dead will once again be clothed by the five skandhas. But this time the five skandhas will be perfected, needing no food to sustain nor clothing to cover them. The souls will exist in complete happiness, untouched by physical needs. It will be similar to the existence and happiness of a flying immortal, or like having the knowledge to speak with powers. Everything under heaven feels happy if body and soul are happy. Such a union of body and soul creates happiness. Um, So uh, in in this second sutra, you can already see there's a reference to reincarnation. And in the fourth sutra that I'll get at, uh, you'll see a heavy emphasis on uh, reincarnation. Um, Okay, I'm going to read. I'm going to skip chapter four and read chapter five, where they're talking about to not worship ghosts or essentially pagan uh, entities. Because ghosts, if you're familiar with Chinese culture, you have hungry ghosts. Ghosts are essentially spirits, and it's saying to not worship other spirits, but it's using the term ghost. 
Do not worship ghosts. Virtue can only be practiced in this world. The one sacred spirit controls everything, and you should do as the spirit demands, good deeds in this life. This is the only world in which you can perform good karma. Do not think about any other world. All acts of merit and benevolence must be performed in this world, not the next. Be charitable here, because in the other world you cannot be. So being aware of this, become open-handed and not tight-fisted and narrow. You can only be charitable and generous in this world, not the next. So rid yourself of evil and poison in your heart and abandon all the all your bad thoughts and jealousy. You can only do this in this world, not the next. With peace of mind, worship God in this world, for it won't be possible in the next. Worship God with all your heart, and your sins will be forgiven. And you can do this now, but not in the next world. So worship with all your heart. There's a reference to uh, uh, essentially the message of Christ in Matthew. You know, uh, worship God with all your your heart, uh, mind, and soul, and then love your neighbor as yourself. You will reap the consequences of this life in the next world, but can do nothing once you are there. This will bring happiness. It is how the one sacred spirit designed things and left it for us to choose. There is no other way for there is no other way to free us from sins but for him to enter this world. So he came and suffered a life of rejection and pain before returning. To know this is to know who he was. To know the one sacred spirit became incarnate and the holy sacred spirit. Knowing this, you should do as is commanded. Follow these teachings and worship the one sacred spirit. A benevolent act done in the knowledge of this suffering is the only true benevolent act, acceptable only by these teachings and none other. It is like building a house. The house needs firm foundations. It needs firm foundations or it will be useless. If people wish to be virtuous, they should follow the commands of of the one and only sacred spirit. Understand that the one sacred spirit provides, presides over all existence to be venerated. Strive to do what is right and be grateful for the grace you have received. To sing praises, to chant and worship and encourage others to do so is highly virtuous. Always do good and keep your heart pure. Remain true to God. Unless you realize this, all your virtuous acts will fail just as the house without firm foundations will fall. As soon as the wind blows, the house is gone. But built on firm foundations, not even the strongest wind can conquer. Thus, a virtuous deed done without understanding of God fails. In order to see the one sacred spirit, people must keep themselves pure in heart and act and... and <clears throat> As an act of grace, all will become clear. The five skandhas are all different, yet the five skandhas with body and soul are all one. They all, came, they all became strong and worshipped the one sacred spirit for the creation and for the image they have been made in. Pray and worship for eternity. All plants have a time of growth and harvest according to the seasons, spring and autumn, winter and summer. All follow one another, and the four seasons shape the year. Day and night form the cycle of 12 days of the, of the 12... <laughs> Day and night form the cycle of 12 days of the 12 characters cycle. This refers to the traditional Chinese system of using the 12 animal signs as names for the, 12, for the days in the 12-day or year cycles. This happens through the benevolence of the one sacred spirit who is holy. The wisdom of God is without origin. It is changeless. It is immutable. This is naturally so. Um, let's see here. All right, I'm going to read the last chapter, chapter 6, too. So here's chapter 6. The law and teachings of the one sacred spirit are better than any of our earthly rulers who call themselves sons of heaven. Ordinary people of those of Jewish faith know about opponents. Evil... Evil, ghostly spirits try to lead people away from the true course. They make them unable to hear or see truth. People thought they knew what to do from the teachings of other spirits and deities. They did what seemed right, but they were easily confused and drawn into evil by bad spirits. They did not know how to find the true center. It is like someone who copies the good actions of other people, but has no understanding of what or why he is doing it. So it is with those who who do not know the sacred spirit, they can never have good fortune. They are like animals on all fours, and their hearts are no better than such a than that such as a beast. They cannot 
comprehend, and because they there is no true discernment or understanding, they can find no chance of the compassion of release. Knowing this, one can see why animals cannot comprehend and do not worship the one sacred spirit. They do not make sacrifices. Evil spirits cause evil deeds. These evil spirits are truly evil. There are there are none better at leading foolish people astray than the evil spirits who entice them from the true path. Some foolish people carve wood or stone and call it a sacred spirit, and this is the evil spirits are called the enemies of humanity. If people know good from evil, they will be safe, but if not, the evil spirits will trap them. Bad deeds come from the evil spirits, but if, but if anyone could calm these spirits and bring them to understand the truth, then they could be enlightened and all would be happy as flying immortals. The evil, the evil ones turn to the path of evil. Then there are the foolish ones who, despite knowing what is right, do evil acts. Such people are no better than the enemies of humanity and are foes of the one sacred spirit and the people. By such actions, they cast out they are cast out. They lose their true home and are sent to the region where evil dwells. Thrown out of the three places, they dwell, in the, they dwell with the spirits. The leader of these is known as the cruel evil ghost, Satan, which is the name foreigners give to the most powerful of evil spirits. The effect of the evil ghost spirit's force is to turn people away from the true way. Th- those who follow the ways of those spirits are called scions of the ghost. They are like malignant spirits who turn people to the evil way. Thus, they are cast out from heaven. Evil forces blow across the world, threatening all. People fall under the influence of these spirits, and these evil forces oppose the good nature and stay in their homes to trap them forever. The worst of these is called Sanu, Satan. So that's the Chinese, Sanu. Foreigners have described this as being a ghost. It constantly strives to entrap humanity. All these evil ghosts and spirits were cast from heaven's light and, and went down into the evil path. The evil spirits hate it when people do the right things, so they never cease their attacks on those who worship the one. They work endlessly to do evil and through evil to make people follow the evil way. Many foolish people are thus seduced to stop worshiping and following the one sacred spirit with all their heart. Their words become wicked. Such a way leads to the central of three evil paths guided by the evil spirits. They are doomed to be reborn into the world with a worse position in life. So here's reincarnation. Trapped in the 10,000 kalpas or ages. Uh, That's... Buddhist, Hindu type stuff, from which there is no escape from rebirth. The evil spirits concentrate on evil and only see evil and only think evil. Over and against this, in the four quarters under heaven, there is the one who encourages good. Yet in the four quarters under heaven, there are also evil doers. They try to trick people into following the evil way, the work of evil spirits. Therefore, turn to the one sacred spirit and find true holiness in your actions. The first ten the first treaties on the one oneness of heaven. So that is the, uh, that is the second sutra, the sutra of cause and effect and salvation. So I'm going to skip the third sutra. Where are we at? 43 minutes. Holy shit. Um, I'm going to skip the third sutras for the sake of time. And I'm probably going to just skip through some of, the fourth sutra, because I don't think many people are going to watch this, depending on how long it is. So here's a little something on the description of the fourth sutra, which I'm getting ready to read. The last of these early sutras is the Sutra of Jesus Christ. In the Chinese, Jesus is transliterated into what may be seen and read as as Yesu, Y-E-S-U, Yesu. And Christ is Mi Shi Su, which is Messiah. The complication of different Christian books, this sutra was produced around 645, about a decade after the arrival of the mission. So yeah, so 635, Alopen arrives in the Tang Dynasty, 645, this is taught. Um, It uses good Chinese, 
and it uses portions of the teaching of the apostles, which was uh, in the first one. And it makes the core teachings of, Judah, of Jesus more Buddhist in tone. Most important, it includes texts and ideas from the Tibetan church and materials from a book which shows strong Jain and Hindu influences. Oh, that's also true. So uh, most people aren't aware that there's a Christian church in Tibet. Uh, it was eventually destroyed. However, it's really interesting that wherever Christianity went in this ancient world, it was able to establish itself. It had a sort of... Uh, uh, a convincibility among people. So it would go into foreign cultures, it would learn these languages, and then it would synthesize their religious systems with the Christian system, and it did a really good job of convincing people and converting people. So here is the fourth sutra, the Sutra of Jesus Christ, and this sutra is, is particularly Buddhist. So as the other three are much more Taoist in nature, this one is much more Buddhist, and uh, it's believed that it may have been written to convert Buddhists to Christianity in Tibet. At this time, the Messiah taught the laws of God, of Yahweh. He said, There are many different views as to the real meaning of the sutras, and on where God is, and what God is, and how God was revealed. The Messiah was orbited by the Buddhas, or the disciples. Looking down, he saw the suffering and he saw that all that is born. And so he began to teach. Nobody has seen God. Nobody has the ability to see God. Truly, God is like the wind. Who can see the wind? God is not still, but moves on the earth at all times. He is in everything and everywhere. Humanity lives only because it is filled with God's life-giving breath, the Holy Spirit. Peace comes only when you, cannot, when you can rest secure in your own place, when your heart and mind is at rest in God, day in and day out. There you exist in contentment, open to where you may be led. God leads the believer to the place of contentment and great bliss. All teachers, such as the Buddhas, are moved by this wind, and there is nowhere in the world where the wind does not reach and move. God's palace is, his, is in this place of peace and happiness, yet he knows the suffering and actions of the whole world. Everyone in the world knows that the wind blows. We can hear it, but we cannot see it. We cannot see its shadow. Nobody knows where it, what it really looks like, whether it is pleasing to look upon or not, or whether it is yellow, white, or even blue. Nobody knows where the wind dwells. God's sacred spirit, for, God's sacred spirit force allows him to be in one place, but where it is nobody knows. But where it is, nobody knows, or how it gets there. God is beyond the cycle of death and birth, beyond being called male or female. God made both heaven and earth. God's sacred spirit force has never been fully manifested. This power can grant longevity and lead to immortality. When people are afraid, they call upon Buddha's name. Many folk are sadly ignorant. God is a sacred spirit force. God is always beside the believer. There are the sutras. People say they know who God is, but they do not know. It is, in Buddha's, it, is, it is in Buddha's nature to bestow grace. And with this grace comes also a deep, clear understanding that uplifts, uh, lifts us up out of folly. This way, anybody can attain heaven, even if it is not a scholar. The sacred spirit power of God works in everybody, bringing all to fullness. All existence is an act of grace. Every physical form is created. God has brought everything into being. Everything is born, dies, decays, and returns to the earth and continues and continued suffering. So I'm not going to read all this. It's just too long. I'll go ahead and read chapter two, though. Chapter two of the Sutra of Jesus Christ. All that has life known in your hearts that is, to, that is so and by grace understand how to do that which is good. Everything that is born must die. Everything that lives exists only because the winds give it life. When it is time for life to end, the winds depart and from the body, a person's heart and mind are not their own, but are created by the winds. The winds Departure is a time of great distress, but nobody can see the winds at that time. Nobody can see them because they have no form, no color, no red, no green, or any other. The winds of life are invisible. The path is unknown. Similarly, people want to know where God is. The path is unknown, and so it is impossible to see God. Only the virtuous can be in the presence of God, can see God. 
can be in the can enter into the presence of God or can see God. It is not possible for everyone to see God. Those who are blessed and fortunate can feel God close by, but those who do evil will remain sunk in evil because people first understand that God cannot be seen and never has been seen. So the question arises, how can anyone practice the correct way to be blessed? If they avoid the way of earth, of hell, they can attain the way of heaven. However, even if they do not attain the way of heaven, it is still easy for them to sink into the way of evil again. If what they do does not show wisdom, then they are not following the way of heaven. All that lives regard this grace well. There is a great and very great distance between heaven and earth. Some lives are shaped by evil. Those who put their souls into serving the nation receive much wealth as a reward, but those who live wicked lives do nothing do but those who live wicked lives not doing what is ordered by the power of heaven will never achieve success or good power or good posts, sorry. Instead they will be exiled to die in ignominy. Is this not the power of heaven? All such evil stems from the first beings and the disobedience in the fruit of garden, in the fruitful garden. All that lives is affected by the karma of previous lives. God suffered terrible woes so that all should be freed from karma. Nobody is beyond the reach of this Buddha. Those who do good will be blessed and fortunate, but those who do evil will suffer. Um, I'll read the third chapter and then I'll be done. Foolish people make wooden statues of camels, cows, horses, and so on. They make them seem very lifelike and worship them. But they do this not really, but this does not really bring them to life. If you can understand all this, then understand the process of karma's cause and effect. This is a gift unique to human beings. In today's world, there are so many who create images of people, of scholars, and gurus. They think this makes them like God, but they cannot give life to their creations. They really are confused. They make gold, silver, and bronze statues of spirits that they venerate. They even make wooden statues of spirits, people, and animals. But no matter how much the human statue looks like a human, or the, or the horse looks like a horse, or the cow statue like a cow, or the donkey statue like a donkey, they cannot walk, they cannot talk, they cannot eat or drink. They have no real flesh, no skin, no organs, no bones. Even though these statues cannot talk, everybody today wants to talk to them. If you, eat, if you eat something, you should know by its taste and smell whether it is good or bad. Only somebody who truly worships God can teach the sutras and expound the text. Someone who fears punishment does what is right and tells others to do likewise. God loves such a one, and they are known to be the followers of God's law. However, Somebody who knows in their heart the right way to follow but does not do good and encourages others to not do good is unacceptable to God. Such people are trapped by luxuries and illusions, too preoccupied with appearances, too attached to life's pleasures, and they are following the wrong path. Such people will end up in the hands of King Yama, God of judgment and rebirth. But even those who accept the teachings of God, who often say, I obey God, who teach others to obey God, should fear God, be watchful every day of slipping. Remember, all, of, all depends on God. Everything should be, everything, everybody should seek the right relationship by resolving their bad actions. Life and death are controlled by the sacred spirit, and everyone should fear God. This fear is like the fear of the emperor. The emperor is who he is because of his previous lives, which have led to his being placed in the fortunate position. He is chosen by God, so cannot, so cannot call himself God because he has been appointed by God to do what is expected. This is why the people obey the emperor, and this is right and proper. Everyone should obey the commands. If anybody disobeys, then they are punished. Wise people understand this and teach others to act likewise. Those who are the people who live by the precepts, if you do not fear God, even if you live by the law of the Buddha, you will not be saved. Indeed, you will be counted among the traitors. The third aspect is to fear your parents. You should honor your parents just as you honor God, the emperor. If you honor the emperor and not your parents, then God will not bless you with good fortune. And this goes on for chapter four, chapter five, and that's it. So this video is already way too long. Uh, it's almost an hour. 
So I'll leave it there. Uh, hopefully you like that. Hopefully you uh, could get through my reading. Um, it's a really, really interesting book. I highly recommend it. Um, as you saw in that last section where it talks about honoring the emperor, this is one of the things that mentioned that the Tang Dynasty liked about Christianity is that you know Jesus says essentially give Caesars what is Caesar. So Christianity is not about an empire in this world as maybe the Islamic understandings of the of the Ummah and the Caliphate and all these things or some of the other religious traditions or empires at the time. Christianity, of course, it did in the West with Rome and Byzantium, but it it has this um, this distinction between you know what is of the world and what is of heaven. So interesting stuff. I hope you like it. Let me know what you think. I know this video is way longer than I was even planning on making it, but this is the Jesus Sutras by Martin Palmer. Get you a copy, read it, and let me know what you think. So, anyways, thanks guys. Love you and uh, God bless. Oh, please like, share, and subscribe. And God bless.